The most common question my guest today, Dr. Joe Dispenza, hears is why is it so hard to break an old habit and how do you do it? Most people wait until it's almost too late in order to change. You can learn and change in a state of suffering or you can learn and change in a state of joy. You choose. Neuroscientific researcher Dr. Joe Dispenza is an expert in the role of function and the human brain. He creates a bridge between true human potential and the latest scientific theories of neuroplasticity. He's a New York Times best-selling author of Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, You Are the Placebo, and his latest book, Becoming Supernatural. Welcome. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> happy to be with you. So happy to be with you as <laughs> well. So that I, I was talking about that state of crisis, and we do. I'm saying we because I get there too. Hitting rock bottom, crisis, states of incoherence. Why do we keep doing that same habit? Well, a habit is a redundant set of automatic, unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that's acquired through repetition. A habit is when you've done something so many times that your body literally knows how to do it better than your mind. Turns out, by the time we're 35 years old, we're a set of memorized programs. Uh, and so the body is functioning and the mind is unconscious. So then when there's crisis or there's trauma or there's disease or diagnosis or loss, the event sometimes causes people to feel so differently than themselves that they can finally see themselves through the eyes of somebody else. Now, that moment in neuroscience is called metacognition. This is the moment where we start paying attention to how we think. We start thinking about what we're thinking about. We start noticing how we're acting, how we're speaking. We start becoming aware of the emotions that we live by. And the moment you start observing those states of mind and body, you're no longer the program. You're the consciousness observing that program. And we begin to objectify our subjective self. In other words, you can't read the label when you're inside the jar. You've got to get out of the jar to be able to see who you are. So most people wait for that moment where they feel so bad that they could finally begin to make an effort to change. And of course, times are changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my message is why wait? Why not just start creating a future every day and begin to think differently? You begin to act differently and begin to feel differently. And if you do that enough times, that becomes the new habit. It becomes the new habit, but when the crisis, because things are so accelerated now, and the more that we get into crisis, that I think it's like a wheel, you just spin, or I just spin, I'm not gonna say you. When that upset happens, say you're in the state of coherence and it's great, and then you know there's a loss of a loved one, or there's a flood in your house, or something, breaks the state that's not small. Sure. Well, I mean, we may not be able to control everything in our outer world, right. but we certainly can control our inner world. And so it's not so important to not react. I mean, everybody reacts. I react. The question is, how long are you going to react? So if you okay. keep an emotional reaction going on for an extended period of time, you're memorizing that emotion and your body as the unconscious mind is believing it's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The body uh, doesn't know the difference between the real experience that produces the emotion and the emotion that we create by thought alone. So then the emotion then reaffirms the state and then people start to use the problems and the conditions in their life to keep that emotion going, and I would call that an addiction. So mm -hmm. we become addicted to the very life we don't even like. So it's important then for people to realize then when you have that moment where you have crisis or something breaks down, that you do have control over it, and it's a formula, and it's a skill, and our research shows that you can teach people how to do that. And so then when you're living by some emotion, there'll always be a gap between the way things appear and the way things really are. Emotions alter our perception. And if you act during that time, you'll always say the same thing. I should have never said that. I should have never done that. I should have mm -hmm. never thought that. I should have never sent that email. So then shortening your emotional reactions is a level of intelligence then that causes you then to recalibrate because most people don't think they have control over that. They'll say, that person did it to me. That right. circumstance is the reason why I am this way. Then I would say, if something in your outer environment is controlling your thoughts and feelings, then you're a victim to your environment. Yeah. And yet, how you think and feel creates 
your outer world. So if you're thinking and feeling equal to everything that's known in your present personal reality, you keep creating more of the same. So to change then is to think and feel greater than the conditions in your environment. And to be able to do that to such a degree then, you're no longer reacting to the same people in the same way. And that takes an effort. It's, and it's not easy in the beginning. But once you start practicing, uh, you get better at it. And just like anything else, you start to move through your life with more coherence and you're less likely to knee jerk. And if you're less likely to knee jerk, then you're not in an unconscious program. So you said there's a formula. Is it, is it an anchor or something that you can set to break that habit, break that pattern from going into the crisis mode or the overreaction or the victimization? Well, look, I mean, everybody, I believe, has done something great in their life. Yeah. Everybody's done something great. And what happened? You just got a wild idea, right? You got a vision of some possibility. You were struggling with your present circumstances, and all of a sudden you weren't so interested in checking your cell phone every two minutes. Right. You weren't so interested in the dinner that you were supposed to go to or person you usually call up and complain to. Picking you're up not your phone. And you're not, yeah, you're not interested mm -hmm. in the television exactly. shows. All of a sudden, you start thinking and contemplating. Is there a new way to do this? Is there a better way? What would it be like to be healthy, to be happy, to be free, to have a new career, a new relationship? The moment you ask that question, you turn on the creative center in your brain, your frontal lobe, the workshop. And the frontal lobe has connections to the entire landscape of the brain. And so it wants to answer that question. It's the forebrain. It's, our, it's, the, it's a place where we speculate possibilities. We invent, we have attention or intention. So that we say, what would it be like to have a new career? And the frontal lobe goes, okay, let's look to see what we have stored in the brain. I have a certain amount of knowledge and a certain amount of experience. And it begins to select these different networks of neurons mm -hmm. and begins to call them up in, in relation to that question. And when the brain starts firing in tandem, all of a sudden you get a picture in your mind. That's called intention. Mm -hmm. You're selecting a new potential in the quantum field. Now, to the passionate person, the thought that they're having in their mind literally becomes the experience. And the end product of an experience is called an emotion. But now they're not feeling sadness or pain or suffering or fear. They're feeling gratitude. They're feeling inspired. They're feeling optimistic. They're feeling a heart-centered emotion. And when you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion, you're beginning to change your brain and body from living in the past present reality to living in the future present reality. And the stronger the emotion that you feel, the more you'll pay attention to the picture in your mind. Mm -hmm. And now you're beginning to emboss the circuitry in your brain, creating a long-term memory and emotionally conditioning your body into that future. And we could say then, you're remembering your future. Yes. And now the idea then is to get up and to get your behaviors to match your intentions. Mm -hmm. You have to then stay conscious of those thoughts that say, start tomorrow, I'm too tired, this will never work, it didn't work last time. You gotta be the governor of those thoughts. You gotta start making different choices and the hardest part about change is not making the same choices that you did the day before. Over over. So you gotta review the choices that you're not gonna make. You gotta think about the behaviors you're gonna change, even how you speak. Mm -hmm. What experiences do you need to stay away from with certain people in certain places and times? And what emotions bring you to a lower denominator that causes you to no longer see that vision because that emotion, that familiar emotion is going to cause you to view your future through the lens of the past. So then, then you, when you combine a thought and a feeling, it's called a state of being. So then your job is to maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day to keep your energy up, independent of other people and the conditions in your life, mm -hmm. independent of the habits and emotional addictions in your body, and independent of time. And I say, if you do that properly, get ready, because something unusual is going to happen in your life. It's the law, and it's going to come in a way that you've never thought of. That's the unknown. That's the surprise. The brain learns by mistakes mm -hmm. and surprises. Why not have a few surprises? So then the moment you start feeling a familiar emotion or you go back to an old state of being, mm -hmm. you've disconnected from your future and you're back to your past. Don't expect anything to change. And if you say, it's that person that did it to me, I'm gonna say, great, but that's being a victim to your life. So then 
it takes practice. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, and it's trial and error. And there are days where you have just the connection and it flows yeah. and it's smooth and it's free. And other days you're getting hit from every direction because the universe is saying, you want wealth, you want freedom, you want health. Well, let me show you how much you have to be initiated to maintain that state independent of those conditions. And when you do, now no person, no thing will move you from it. Now it's permanent. And people are now beginning to understand that. And so the person who heals themselves from a disease in our work, they say to me, the disease exists in the old personality. Mm-hmm. It doesn't exist with me anymore. And I'm ready for the next challenge. Come on, I'm ready. I want to be, be challenged. I was more alive when I was challenged. Yes. So now you're no longer contracting from your life. You're engaging in life. And I, and I think that's a healthy way to live. Oh, yeah. What, this is your example of your personality creates your personal reality. Your personality change and it creates your personality. I, I think that's beautifully said. Well, your personality is made up of how you think, how you act and how you feel. So the present personality who's watching this show has created the present personal reality called their life. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense if you wanna create a new personal reality, a new life, you gotta change your personality, which means you gotta start thinking about what you've been thinking about. Start modifying your behaviors and noticing how you feel. And if you do that enough times, sooner or later, you're gonna disengage from that old personality. But the next step, is what thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain? What behaviors do I want to demonstrate in one day, in one lifetime? And the act of closing your eyes and rehearsing your behaviors. Mental rehearsal actually installs neurological circuits in your brain. You're priming your brain to, to, to begin to become that person. And then if you say, can I teach my body emotionally what my future is gonna feel like before it happens? You're not gonna wait for your health to feel wholeness and, and gratitude. You're not gonna wait for your new relationship to feel love. That's, that's the old model of reality of cause and effect. You're actually going to cause an effect, which means the moment you start feeling gratitude and wholeness, your healing begins. The moment you start falling in love with life in yourself, you create an equal. So now you're causing an effect. So then people who do this consistently they literally create a new personality. And of course, they create a new personal reality. Their life changes, they have all these different opportunities that begin to show up. And and it it takes time in the beginning because breaking the habit of of some aspect of yourself requires a constant state of awareness. That was, I was gonna ask you how much time, because can this happen in an instant, as you've seen in your workshops, or can it happen over repetitive meditation and going through that experience over and over in your mind? Gosh, I, you know, Lisa, I, I, I'm in such an interesting place because I, I, I never thought that I would see what I'm witnessing uh-huh. in my lifetime in the way people are engaging in this work. In fact, uh, it's like the four minute mile. You know, mm. uh, the four minute mile is just a barrier of consciousness. and. And now I'm seeing people, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, with stage four cancer or or Parkinson's disease or lupus or tumors or whatever. They they stand in front of an audience and they they say, "Uh, I'm completely cancer free. And they tell their story and it's not glamorous, I want you to know. They've lost everything. They've Mm -hmm. lost their job, they had bankruptcy, they were sick, Mm -hmm. they lost people. I mean, they were challenged Mm -hmm. and they kept doing the work. They could have said, I don't feel like it, I'm too tired, Mm -hmm. I'm too sick, Mm -hmm. it takes too long, I have too many things to do. They never excuse themselves from, from, from that effort. And so when you witness that in an audience, Again and again. Again and again and again. Not only are you piercing a veil of consciousness like the four minute mile that allows other people to do it, but it's not only in the field, but you're witnessing the evidence and you cannot go back to being the same person again. So the woman is 68 years old. She has Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Her face was paralyzed. She couldn't do many things. She could barely speak. And now she's standing on the stage telling her story and she's jumping up and down. And you have to think, well, if it happens to her, it could possibly happen to me. So then there's a new normal that's beginning to take place, a new standard uh, Mm -hmm. where people are beginning to go, it is possible. Now I understand that I can upregulate new genes and Mm -hmm. downregulate old genes. Now I can rewire my brain, that I'm not doomed to this. 
And so, so when just like a just like a, a, a infection spreads amongst the community and creates a disease, I believe that health and wellness can be as as infectious as disease. And you get enough people together, uh, you start seeing those miraculous things. And so, I believe now in watching people that every time somebody makes the effort or has a transformation, that information is in the field, it's in the quantum. But at the same time, it's also being spread in three-dimensional reality because the evidence is here. So we have the measurements to prove it, we have the people's uh, experience to prove it, and we have momentum. Mm -hmm. And so some people, mm -hmm. the, the true, true uh, uh, pathfinders, the trailblazers, yeah. some of them, it took them three years to reverse a genetic condition that the doctor said was impossible to uh -huh. change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, now, people who have seen that person with the same condition that they have are doing it in a shorter amount of time. So there's a momentum because right. there's a shift in consciousness. So I've seen it take years for certain people, long haul, but they made it. But they, they, they laid footprints it does for help. other people. Yeah, it helps when you see it, you believe it. This is a time in history where it's not enough to know. This is a time in history to know how. And evidence speaks for itself. Uh -huh. That's why we've done so many brain scans and so many HRV yeah. measurements and genetic tests and telomere tests and immune system regulation and energy tests because I want people to see the evidence. It's, it's, not, just, it's not just in their mind, it's in their brain. It's not just, it's in their body. We want, we want to prove to people that it's possible. So then you scratch your head and say, if that happens to that person, they don't look like a movie star, they don't look like a famous person, they're right. not a Buddhist monk, they just look like a normal person. Right, yes. And, and some, you know, they're not all vegetarians and uh, they're, they're not all celibate and, you know, they don't, uh, some of them drink wine, I mean, they're just normal people. Mm. And, and that, I think that creates some type of community that transcends all the things that people do matter to matter, you know. You do all the right things matter to matter, you change your diet, you exercise, it's all important. Uh, but if yeah. you're living by mm. some emotion, if the environment signals the gene and the end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion, you live by the same emotion every single day. You're signaling the same gene in the same way. And sooner or later, that gene's going to begin to break down. Change yeah. your emotional state and understand why you're doing it and assign meaning to it. And every day you get up in a different emotional state you are knocking on the genetic door, and sooner or later, you're gonna reprogram that gene, and yes. you've seen it. That's how you break genetics, that's how you break history. Change your that's genetic destiny. Yes, it yeah. is possible. You spend a large amount of your times in these incredible week-long intensives. I actually wanna show you an example of what happens so you can get a feeling for it. Take a look. If you come to the monastery and you pretend to be limited by your problems in your life because you talk about them all the time, that's the body and brain you'll be wearing. If you're laying in bed and you're giving yourself the line, you're gonna do it later, do it tomorrow. Now is the new later at this event. Get up and just take your body. Don't let it reason with you because it's going to talk you out of possibility because you just won't feel like it. I want you to understand that we're gonna push you outside of where you normally stop. And if you're willing to truly Put all of your attention and effort into this. You will begin to transform yourself and you'll begin to transform your life. Once we overcome ourselves, magic starts to happen. Miracles start to occur. The mysticism, the energy of it, literally begins to shape and condition the space. And you will witness miracles this week. You will witness them. looks like people are in this incredible field from all walks of life. How do you create that over and over again? You know, I know a few things now. I now know that uh, after looking at all these brain scans and studying people, I believe that you and I are at our absolute best when we get beyond ourselves. Yeah. When you forget about yourself, that is the moment you are connecting to something greater. The first couple of days of these week-long events, people come for all kinds of reasons. They have a disease, they have a loss, they, have a, they want a new life, they want a, a new relationship, they want to have a mystical experience. They just want to learn all, all different reasons. And that first day, they come with all their problems, mm -hmm. all their thoughts, all their, they're, they're pretty much beat up from their environment. And we, we get them through that first day where they start to connect. And by that second day, 
they start really starting to feel a change. Once that happens and people start popping, uh -huh. then I know then I'm going to work with the group to create that ecstatic state where that's where the miraculous happens. And I also know that I never try to do it the same way mm. as I did the time before because in the quantum, you, there's, you know, predictability and repetition are two things you just can't do. So I trust the audience. I trust the movement. Uh, we have usually 40 to 50 different cultures at our week-long events from all over the world. They're large events. And um, we have such a strong community, and that community is bound by love. It's bound by elevated states. So, so it, it happens all different ways, but the outcomes are always the same, that there we, we witness the miraculous. <laughs> yeah. So you had an event in Toronto where you actually had this entire thousand people propelling off the top of the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> I've yeah. never heard of this before. <laughs> well, uh, let me break it down so it's really simple. Okay. <clears throat> Over the last six years, we have done extensive scientific tests on meditation, the work that we do. And we're interested in creating brain coherence, brain order, uh, synchronization, and heart coherence. And our students, uh, based on our measurements, can do that very well. But they're doing it in a room with a thousand people. The music's playing. It's quiet. It's soft. It's beautiful. It's, they're right. comfortable and they can relax into it and really really work on their inner world and actually follow the follow the instructions and be able to to connect to that to that process it's a formula so i started thinking when i when we started doing these week long events well what if we create an activity that would normally bring up an emotion a stressful emotion like fear, fear. Mm -hmm. or doubt or unworthiness or a voices in their head start mm -hmm. running and and in that moment, eyes open, <laughs> when it counts the most to be able to self-regulate, to stop and realize that they can settle their brain and body down and practice it now with the condition that would be challenging them. So we've done seven or so advanced week-long events. And when I went to Toronto, I was, I, I was doing a lecture there, and I went and checked out the hotel we were, we were negotiating with. And there was no room for the course that we normally create. Okay. So the only way to go was up. So I looked at the building, and I thought, OK, this would be an edge that would be a great teaching if people could come to their edge. You know, we all have an edge in our life. Yes. And, and be able to, in that moment when fear could really grip you, Mm -hmm. to make one of two choices, either to forget everything you learn and go into panic mode and go back into survival, or say, I got this, just give me a minute and let me regu regulate here, and begin to practice what they've learned and take it to the next level. Now, what's the, what's the importance of that? Number one, if they can do that in that moment, and we measure that, by the way. You're measuring their field? And we're their... measuring their, their, their heart response. Okay. And so, you know, when you're, when you're fearful, your heart's racing, Adrenaline, right? Adrenaline, yeah. But, but they, many of them settled that, that whole f function down, which means then if they can go over the edge and literally change that, when they come to the edge in their life, to the challenge in their life that normally causes them to go unconscious and run a program, that in that moment in their life, this is when it matters the most. Uh, I, I, that, that's just a metaphor. When they do it in their life and they're able to self-regulate, they'll be more kind and more compassionate and more aware and more caring and more loving and more giving when everybody else is being angry and hostile and, and, and fearful. This is, this, is the, this is the test right here. And if the scale of that event is so challenging mm. that when they face the problems in their life, they're going to be like, are you kidding me? I just went over, uh, over the edge in 30, 38 floors. Uh, this is nothing. And so their perception about the challenges in their life begin to change as well. And so we've had numerous breakthroughs. We had people of all ages doing it. And, um, and, and there's a teaching that goes with it because this is not an adrenaline high. This is not what I'm teaching. I don't want it to be an adrenaline rush. Mm. I actually am, am after the opposite. I'm asking for them to take adrenaline and settle it down and change their brain and body in that moment so they can overcome that emotional state. So if you can do it in that moment, that is the moment that matters the most. Then when you come to the edge in your life, you're going to move through that edge and then there'll be another edge. Another edge. And, and you got to move through that. Mm -hmm. But at least 
you'll have the a tool to be able to do it without just reacting unconsciously. So, because once you do it, your brain then creates that memory. The experience, the yeah. experience then is logged in your brain, and yeah. you just say, "Give me a minute." And ah. so many, so many people, you know, the, the emails that we get now, so many people are just saying, "My life just seems just so easy. I'm just moving through it so much easier. I'm not reacting to the same conditions. I'm so glad I went over the edge." Now, <laughs> that doesn't mean that it wasn't scary for them, but we're giving them a meditation to do so they can get in the right state, and then they walk out and they stay in that state. They keep their energy up. And if you have an opportunity to heal another person, and you're getting really good at this, you're not going to say, "And oh, wait a second, I got to go do a meditation and come back." Right. That's not where we're right. going. You yeah. got to be able to say, "Okay, let me just change my state," and you got to be able to do it with your eyes open. Uh -huh. You got to be able to do it on command, right uh -huh. on the spot. That's where we're going. Mm -hmm. And right. so, so now we have to bridge the inner world with the outer world. We have to begin to to begin to execute or be, demonstrate what we've been doing. And so the training now is not just doing it in the meditative state. The training now is doing it in your life. That's when it matters the most. Eyes open, fully wide awake. Mm -hmm. Eyes open, eyes closed, it's the same. Let's take a look here at this video of this extraordinary event. Take a look. The challenge activity is to test you to your edge. When people get to that point in their life, they don't think that they have any control. What is an initiation? You're taking an understanding, a philosophy. You're taking theory, knowledge, and now you're understanding it from an intellectual level. We set up the conditions in the environment and you're gonna to have to make one of two choices. To fall back into a program and forget everything you've learned or you're actually going to apply what you've learned in that moment to take you past those conditions. If you can settle your brain and body into the present moment, you're overcoming thousands of years of hardwired programs around fear. Why don't we just go over the edge? Falling too fast to prepare for this Tripping in the world could be dangerous Everybody circling as vultures Negative, nepotist Everybody waiting for the fall of man Everybody praying for the end of times Everybody hoping they could be the one I was born to run, I was born for this Whatever it takes By the way, we, we set a world record yeah, in Toronto for the number of people that uh, repelled in, the, in that amount of time. How many people went? <laughs> I think it was like 950. Oh, of, my uh, goodness. Yeah. Propelled in, off of that. Yeah, in, in six days, yeah. And, and the, the, uh, the company that we work with, they were so great. And, uh, 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 and we had such a great, great time together, so yeah. It, it sounds cool. incredible, incredible, but it only could happen in that state of complete coherence. Now, how long does that state last? Do you have, do you go in and out of it? Look, I mean, it's not like it's on and off thing. There are degrees of coherence, okay. and Good. there's degrees of incoherence, okay? Now, some of the measurements ooh, that we're getting now just talk about brain coherence, yeah. okay? But we started out on this venture, and we started measuring brain coherence. Now, uh, your brain is of 100 billion neurons, right? And there's networks that are all kind of wired together. So you have a network 
to speak a language. You mm-hmm. have a network uh, to move a body part. You have a network to see certain shapes and colors. They're all just individual networks. And so when you're living by the hormones of stress and you're reacting to something and your body's knocked out of balance, when you're in stress, you can't predict the next moment. You have the perception that things are going to get worse. You have the thought that you're losing control. And so what happens is these chemicals switch on so that you're in survival and you're mobilizing enormous amounts of energy to prepare yourself for whatever it is in the environment. Short term, it's cool. Everybody mm-hmm. can handle that. Mm-hmm. All organisms can adapt to short term stress. But if the stressors keep coming and you're trying to control and predict everything in your life and you're switching your attention from your cell phone to your problems, to your husband, mm-hmm. uh, to the shopping, to you know uh, another person or your boss, another thing. Every, every person, every object, every thing, every place has a neurological network in your brain. So as the hormones are arousing your brain and you shift your attention, If you were to measure the brain when it's doing that, you have different networks that are firing out of order. And you measure that, it's like a a group of people that have no rhythm playing the drums at the same time. Totally incoherent. Incoherence. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a state like that, what happens mostly is you narrow your attention on the danger. You begin to focus on an object in your environment that's, that's associated with that danger. So the stronger the emotion you feel from some reaction or condition in your life, the more you're going to pay attention to the cause. And if where you Tunnel place vision, yeah, right? so you mm-hmm. where you place your attention is where you're placing your energy. So you're giving your power away to your boss, to your problem. So then what we've realized and research shows it over and over again that when you go from that kind of single-minded, narrow focus, it's only one type of focus, and all of a sudden you begin to expand your focus, you begin to open your awareness. Mm -hmm. You go from focusing on matter to focusing on energy, from focusing on the particle in quantum physics to focus on the wave. That when you begin to open your awareness and you focus on nothing, the moment you start sensing space, you're no longer thinking. And if you're no longer thinking, you're no longer analyzing. And if you're no longer analyzing, you're not activating those circuits in your brain. So your brain waves start to slow down and the autonomic nervous system begins to merge. And the autonomic nervous system now wants to create order and wholeness and balance. And it says, "Uh, Lisa's gone, Uh, Joe's gone, let's get in here and create order while they're gone because what a mess. And all of a sudden it starts to synchronize different compartments in the brain. And what syncs together links together. And all of a sudden the brain starts functioning in a more holistic state. So we've seen in our work, when people start getting these different networks starting to synchronize, Ah. We can now predict what's going to happen. We can say, watch this. We can say to scientists that come and watch our work, watch what happens with this woman. Just keep watching. And all of a sudden, you see the right half of the brain talking to the left half of the brain. All of a sudden, these two hemispheres come Uh together. Uh And the union of polarity, the union of duality, the union of opposites is called wholeness, oneness. And the brain has this psychic union. And at the same time, the heart bursts wide open. Why? Because the person's feeling so whole, they no longer want anything. I mean, how could you want when you're whole? Yeah. So now the heart is coherent, and it's sending more energy to the brain. The brain is coherent, it's sending more information to the body, and all of a sudden, the person's in a whole new state of being. So now, that was our research uh, last year. Now this year, when we start seeing that level of coherence, all of a sudden now, we are going to levels of energy in the brain that have never been recorded Accessed. in the history of neuroscience. Ah. Now a person is connecting to the field and there are hundreds of standard deviations outside of normal in a brainwave state called gamma. Now they're super conscious and not just one part of the brain. The entire brain is in this super, super conscious state and whatever's going on between that person's ears is re- more real than this world we're sitting in right now. They're having a full on sensory experience without their senses. And they can't make their brain do that. It's happening to them. And we, that's not happening with one person, two people. Three. We have the same patterns over and over again. And when we now know that nice. we can induce it, mm-hmm. we now know how to create it. It's redundant. And we now know we can predict it when it's about to happen. I can say, watch this, she's gonna pop, she's gonna go. What do you mean? We just keep watching. And you know, when a brain scientist looks at this, the first thing they think is seizure. They oh. just, they think they, they've never seen anything like this. And, and they, oh, she's having a seizure. And I said, does she look like she's having a seizure? You know, she's just totally connected, big smile on her face. Yeah. Her brain is just in a super, super aroused state. But the arousal is not coming from some threat in her environment. The arousal is coming from within. I mean, her energy is moving up into her brain and she's, the level of coherence 
normal coherence, okay? Incoherence is like a, a group of people in an audience clapping at the end of a show. Oh, okay. Okay, so different. then normal brain mm. coherence is like every five, per, every five people clapping. Super coherence is when everybody's clapping in rhythm. And so that kind yes. of order creates energy in the brain. Yes. So all of a sudden you see this scale of energy going up and it keeps mm -hmm. building and keep building. The mm -hmm. person is having a mystical experience that is gonna transform them forever. They're, they're not gonna be the same person. Yes. And so many times we see like health conditions disappear in one second, in one second, because they're getting a biological upgrade. In that state. In that state. Why? Because oh. experience enriches the brain. And the end product of an experience is an emotion. And now a new emotion is signaling the body, but it's not an emotion like chemical. Yeah. It's electric. When that brain mapping happens, when you're looking at the coherence in the brain, is it a color? Is it the full brain? You can see it. You can see it many different ways. I mean, the technology is so amazing. Uh -huh. but, but, you know, the, the simple way to see it is you have 19 different compartments that's being measured and you have this like little thing, you see, the, you see the lines all going like this. So, yeah, here's beta, then it starts slowing down, alpha, and then they go into theta. But then when they go into the super aroused state, just imagine grabbing a handful of Crayola crayons okay. and going like that. Oh, wow. It looks like a snowstorm. That's what you gamma looks like? High, 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 high amplitudes in gamma. You wow. can't read anything. It looks, it looks like a snowstorm. So we have to figure out other ways to, to, to view it and other ways to read it or scale it down so we can see it. And Fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's, it's way outside of normal. As opposed to fear, what does the brain look like there? Is it... Great question. So when a person's in fear, uh, like we're in normal beta brainwave patterns. Mm -hmm. We're awake, we're aware, and we're aware of our body in, in an environment and in time. Uh, but when you get aroused because of some threat, from beta you move into what's called high beta, a super aroused state. Now the brain is vigilant. It's, it's, it's scanning the environment to predict what's, what's going to happen next. Okay. So high beta is uh, uh, like driving your sports car in first gear on the freeway. It's not going to last very long. Right. But when we see these transitions into gamma, gamma is actually a faster frequency than beta. And the person moves right through beta, right through high beta, right in the gamma. And because it's so orderly, because mm. most high beta is disorderly, but when we see that kind of order and they're passing through high beta, we know they're going to go right in the they're gamma going. and they're, and they're going to go into very, very high amplitudes of gamma. It's amazing that we don't utilize this part of the brain as often as we can. I mean, that this is possible. And from the experience I went through having a near-death experience, I, I can never unsee that. Yeah. I will always know and always seek for this, this supernatural state mm -hmm. of being. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And now that you experience that, it's amazing. Yeah, and you know, the people that come back, um, <laughs> Their spectrum of reality broadens, you mm -hmm. know, because totally. we don't see things how they are. We see things how we are, right? So the brain only perceives equal to how we're wired and how we emotionally feel. So imagine having a full-on sensory experience without your senses right now. What if your senses were heightened right now by 25%? Everything you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling. If your senses are heightened by 25%, your awareness of everything around you is heightened. Awareness is consciousness. You can't have consciousness without energy. So the brain gets a rush of energy, and now the experience lays the tracks down in the brain. And now when we come back to our senses, we are going to perceive a broader spectrum of reality. Now our brain is wired to perceive what has always existed, mm -hmm. but we didn't have the circuits to perceive it. Mm -hmm. And now the person's getting a broader gl glimpse of reality. And science says we perceive less than 1% of reality. Well, <laughs> now, they're, now they're getting a glimpse. Yes, yeah. but in that state, as, I, as you're describing this, disease is so tiny and, and illness is so small and, and conflict is so tiny. Mm -hmm. When you really go to that expanded time, that yeah. senseless, incredible state, those little things, like a tumor, seem so small. The sacred is so much grander than the mundane. Yes. And so in a moment, a person is now no longer in the labyrinth of life. They are looking at it from a, from a different dimension. They know where they need to go. And they're no longer asking anybody for answers. They're getting a, they're getting a download, download from yes. the field. Yes. And we actually call it a download. And with that download mm. comes a biological upgrade. There's an upgrade because all disease mm 
is a lowering of frequency according to the quantum model. Mm -hmm. It's incoherence. A body is disorderly. It's slowing down in frequency. Mm -hmm. So now, once the system switches on, and all of a sudden, that person is drawing from the field, get ready because <laughs> the body is going to take on a new frequency and we see eczema disappear, we see tumors shrink, we just, the, the, the disease is no, can no longer exist because there's getting a, there's, there's a change in the human operating system yes. from energy, not from matter, but from energy. From energy. Yeah. When someone's going through something like a chemotherapy, or I'm sure you've seen this, or a radiation where that tends to be a denser frequency, can you see them shift out of that state if they're currently going through those therapies? Wow. Yeah. Well, we've seen people um, that tried every therapy and w they weren't responding to anything. Mm. But they trusted because they, you know, when you run out, you know, when you run out of options right. and you're left with nothing else right. and it's framed in a way that you can see that you can actually connect to. I mean, think about this. How much of your waking day do you have your attention on matter and how much of your waking day do you have your attention on the field or energy? Most uh. people are, are local in space and time and so all of their attention is on matter. Mm -hmm. So in our work, mm -hmm. we say, when you take your attention off your body, you become nobody. When you take your attention off all the people in your life and your identity, you become no one. You take your attention off your cell phone, your computer, your car, you're in no thing. If you take your attention off the place you're sitting, the place you need to be, you're in nowhere. If you're not thinking about the past or the future and you're in the present moment, you're in no time. And that's the moment you become pure consciousness. That's the moment you're disinvesting all of your attention and energy out of this three-dimensional reality. Now, this three-dimensional reality is real to us because we perceive it with our senses. Yeah. But the quantum is a realm that exists beyond the senses. And you could only experience it with your awareness. So then but imagine... it's just as real. It's more real. Mm. So then, just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So then if I said to you, pay attention to it, connect to it, become more aware of it, stay present with it, moment after moment after moment, like a radio dial, your nervous system is tuning into frequencies. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, you're not doing it with your body. If you're back in your body, you're back in three-dimensional reality. You have to get beyond your body, your environment, and time. Now, that's the moment you're on the bridge to the quantum field. But if you're going to connect to that field, there are greater and greater levels of order and oneness. So then as you begin to connect to that information and you look for it mm -hmm. and you tune into it, every time you feel something, your brain lays down a circuit. Why? That's what experience does. Now you're putting the circuits in place for you to perceive more of it. And if you're focusing on the divine, you just may see the divine in everybody and yes, everything yes. because your brain is wired for it, it. Yes, it seeks for it. There's this great video where they, you show the metronomes getting into that coherent feel. This is really impactful. I want you to pay attention to this. Take a look. So then as you start opening your focus and sensing space and nothing, as you begin to unfold into that infinite vast void, the longer you can linger there as an awareness and you're touching and tuning in to a frequency called the unified field, which his signature is order and rhythm, which is wholeness, sooner or later coherence is going to begin to consume incoherence and all of a sudden the brain will begin to become more integrated. He didn't know anything about me and uh, he knew that I had PTSD, that I had ADD, I had the hypervigilance, everything. He could tell that by my brain map. And uh, like I said, it was kind of shocking, but it also uh, gave me a lot of hope because I knew that through this brain mapping, I could measure my progress. And I actually had the objective um, measurements. The brain maps showed me I could actually go into my meditations and use that information in my meditations to help um, starting to heal myself. And all of a sudden you see the front of the brain talking to the back of the brain. We've seen this so many times. You see the right side of the brain talking to the left side of the brain. And all of a sudden you see the brain starting to move into a more holistic state. 
those brain waves become highly coherent. When that happens, that energy moves right into the heart. And all of a sudden, the person starts to feel connected to something greater. I see that, I see that over and over again, where that negative thought will cause everything to go out of balance and it'll cause total chaos. And once I start getting into nature or I find something that gets me into coherence and pulls me back, it'll start to affect everything else in my body. Sure. And it can be done. You don't need to be a Buddhist monk. You don't need to have, going through a, a, a full week-long workshop is recommended, but you can do it instantly. It's all up to us. Our research shows that you actually don't need 40,000 hours or 40 years of meditation. Are, we're doing it in a week. I mean, it, it's a formula. And once you, you lock into that formula. keep saying formula. Yeah. Can you share that with us or have you already? No, I have. I mean, the formula, of course, is the, is the, the different meditations that we do. Okay. And, and I now know, it's so wild because we've done so many great measurements, that in certain meditations, I can say certain words and all 14 people that are getting their brain scanned will all go into gamma at the same time. They're really? conditioned. Wow. They're conditioned. Huh. Um, so, so the formula is we now know how to get people into that state. And then once they're in that state, uh, now they're accessing from the field. They're connected to something greater. And now it becomes less about changing matter. They don't change matter. That's the illusion. They just change the field. And when you change the field, it changes matter. So people are changing their beliefs on how that's done. So the formula then is getting to that point where they get beyond themselves and they're connecting to the consciousness of everybody, of everyone, of everything, of everywhere, of every time. That is the oneness field. That is the field. Yes. That's where all the information exists. Oh. Now, there's a caveat to this because we've seen this so many times because when you reach that moment, all the things that you thought you wanted, you no longer want because you feel like you mm -hmm. have everything. Mm -hmm. and, complete. and it's a very, a very unusual feeling because the side effect of that is that you now are less interested in uh, anything outside of you bringing you joy. Uh, yeah. you, it's coming from yeah. within you. That's what you want. And so then imagine like uh, our students, certain people, their oxytocin levels go up 200 or 300 uh, times at the end of a workshop. Now, <laughs> of oxytocin course. is the love chemical. Yes. <laughs> so imagine having so much love wow. for life mm. I mean, oxytocin levels, Lisa, normally go up when a, when a female mammal is bonding with her offspring or in the beginning stages of a relationship uh, uh, and there's intimacy, uh, um, the oxytocin creates monogamy and bonding and stuff. And my, and my colleagues that look at or my research, they say, why are you measuring oxytocin in your workshops? I mean, that's normally, you know, in the honeymoon stage of a relationship. What are you guys doing there? And I say, I want our students to fall in love with their future fall in love with the divine. You have to, yes. And, and, and yes. my goodness. So then when oxytocin levels go up 200 times, imagine having feeling so much love, you wouldn't want to trade this feeling for anyone or anything. How are you measuring oxytocin? We're, we're, we're doing blood, you know, tests? blood, saliva, everything. <laughs> I mean, we have people peeing in cups, spitting in cups, we're puncturing people. I mean, but, but imagine, imagine this is an important point because what is unconditional love? Isn't it when you just allow people, right? Imagine having right. so much feeling, that consistent feeling. Mm. It's measured in their uh, oxytocin levels, their neurotransmitters, their heart coherence, there's, there's d different brain systems switched on. You would say, I, I'm not gonna give this feeling up for anyone or anything. Yeah. Now, that's the moment you're free. Now, that's the moment where you're less likely to rely on anybody outside of you to bring you love. In fact, you just feel love for, for no reason. It's exactly what's happening right here, right now. And for anyone watching this video, they can easily tune into this field of coherence and love. Uh, it's, uh, uh, well, of course, I have to remind them of everything they're about to do and why we're doing it. A lot of information, you get them sharing that information. I now know, Lisa, if I can get a group of people together and I can give them sound scientific information, and science is the contemporary language of mysticism. Mm. Science is what demystifies the mystical. The moment you talk religion or culture or tradition, uh, tradition you're gonna divide an audience because someone's gonna switch off. Yeah. But when you science, science creates that kind of unification. So every time you learn something new, you know this, you've, you've seen the videos, you make new connections in your brain, right? So 
if I'm combining quantum physics with neuroscience, neuroendocrinology, psychoneuroimmunology, epigenetics, whatever, and I'm putting it together in a model for them to understand, they're learning that information. Well, if learning is making new connections, remembering is maintaining them. So if I say to them, turn the person next to you and explain what I just said, if they can't explain it, it's not wired in their brain. So between the two people, they start building a model of understanding, right? And they start to not, I don't want to hear about your past or any other theories, just repeat what I said. So as they begin to fire and wire those circuits, they're installing the neurological hardware in their brain in preparation for an experience. Mm -hmm. And the more they understand what they're doing and why, the how gets easier. So then if I can set up the conditions in the environment and give them the proper instruction, the people that get their behaviors to match their intentions and their actions equal to their thoughts, they're going to have some type of new experience or transformation. Mm -hmm. So then the transformation then that we measure, we've measured over the years, gives me more information to teach transformation the next time, yeah, right? Yes, yes. So now we just got it down to a little bit more of a, a science. So that first day, yeah, look, I've looked at enough brain scans in real time, and I know this now, that when you analyze your life within some disturbing emotion, you're mm -hmm. going to make your brain worse because mm -hmm. you're thinking in the past. Mm -hmm. When you get that person beyond their analytical mind and beyond those emotions, they're free. They'll have the answer because they're outside the box. They're, now they're free to see it from a different perspective. Do you think that we're actually accessing different dimensions, like the fifth dimension? or? Wow. Um, I don't think we have enough time for that. But, oh. but uh, when you leave this three-dimensional reality, okay. the fourth dimensional reality is time. Right? And when you're somebody, a someone uh, with something living somewhere and in some time, you're your personality trapped in three dimensional reality. You got to play by the rules of three dimensional mm -hmm. reality, Newtonian physics. The moment you become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time, that's the moment you become pure consciousness and you're disinvesting all your attention and energy out of this three dimensional reality. Now, that is the bridge to the quantum. So then when you start paying attention to that energy, that information, and you start connecting to greater and greater degrees of oneness and wholeness, and you become the consciousness of everybody, everyone, everything, everywhere, and every time, now you're entering that fifth dimension where there are multiple, multiple realities that you get to experience simultaneously. Now, this is the mystical. This is the end part of our workshops, that Saturday and Sunday, mm -hmm. where we explain the secret um, elixirs of the pineal gland and how to activate that, that little radio receiver in the back of your brain that picks up information. And mm -hmm. What happens when the metabolites are released from uh, f uh, derivatives of melatonin that switch on different systems? That's when you start to experience more of yourself, not the self called Lisa, the very big Lisa that has this connection to so many different realms yes. and possibilities. And again, you can't come back as the same person. Can't. You just did it. You just showed us all of that in just a little piece <laughs> of <laughs> time. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Huh. And that you can, that's a brilliant way of describing mystics because they spend so much time in that place of that fifth dimension. They're rarely in the first, second, and third. You know, it's really interesting because when you create from three-dimensional reality, get ready, it's going to take time. Because you're going you're, to create more of the same. Well, you, well, not only that, if you're going to create like a vision, a dream of what you want, a new job or whatever, it's a new relationship, a new house, it's going to take you time to go get it because you've got to drag your body through space and it takes time. Yes. When you create from the fifth dimension, you actually are doing the opposite. You're actually collapsing space and time and you're drawing the experience to you. You don't go and get it. <laughs> when there's a vibrational match mm -hmm. with your energy and something in your future and you're creating from the fifth, you're not playing by Newtonian physics any longer. You're playing by quantum, which means now you are drawing your future to you. You're the magnet to mm. your destiny. So things start showing up in your life out of nowhere because you created them from nowhere. Something appears out of nothing because you created from nothing and it happens in no time because you created it in no time. And so now you're less likely to go and get it. <laughs> you're more likely to, to tune into it and bring it to you. Mm -hmm. So now you're not rushing anywhere to get it. You feel like you understand that there's a different way to do it. Mm. So I'm proud to say mm -hmm. that the people in our community that do this work, they do it every day. You know why? Because they see the magic. 
and they don't want the magic to end. It's and they effortless. Don't, they don't wake up and say, oh God, I gotta create my future today. They're not like that. They're yeah. like, let's go. Yeah. They're excited to do it and the enthusiasm is the energy of creation, right? So They attract it. So do you then, do you watch the news? Do you follow what's happening? Do you, that's definitely a different frequency. You know, I do watch the news because I wanna be informed, but as uh, for me personally, I never focus on people. I focus on principles. Okay. So when you focus on a principle, you're less likely to put it on a person or a thing. When you focus on principles, people can align with principles yeah. and, and no longer be deceived by people or things. And so I do watch it because I want to be informed and I do think this is in a really incredible time to be alive. Mm. Because a new awareness, because of knowledge and information creates a new consciousness, a new consciousness creates a new energy and that new energy is unraveling everything, politically, yeah. economically, socially, religion, education, journalism, the environment, medicine, everything's coming apart because it should. We're way more powerful than, than all of this and all those things have to be exposed for people to really realize, oh, it's, all, it's always been within me. Mm -hmm. I always ask my guests just to wrap up here, your biggest why. What is the biggest reason why you, Joe Dispenza, do what you do for humanity? Why? Why not? I mean, there's nothing else I want to do. I mean, mm -hmm. I, 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 I have a great job in, in witnessing human transformation yeah. and being a part of transformation. And we're wired to care for one another. We're wired to serve one another. We're wired to, to, to truly contribute to one another. That's, that's who we are. You know, all of this media and television and war and politics, yeah. it's, it's prejudice is all to create lack of trust and separation, right? So when you witness that kind of transformation, all the lost luggage, all the missed flights, all the late flights, all the challenges we have, none of it matters for that one person who stands up and says, my tumor's gone. That to me, I, made, I, changed, I changed somebody's future. And that person is gonna change other people's future. And one friend of mine said the other day who had brain cancer that just got a clean bill of health. Uh, a West Point graduate, wow. she went to her doctor. You know what her doctor said to her? Now I remember why I got into medicine in the first place. <laughs> She, she changed his life uh, just by saying, and he, he pronounced her, you know, she wasn't going to make it a few times and she never gave up. Uh, that's and a he, great he reason. said, I am so happy to tell you this. Mm. So happy. So, so you never know what you do in choosing to believe in this stuff, who you're going to affect in some future time. And that's what creates community and that kind of emergence of people that share the same energy, the same beliefs, the same thoughts, the same behaviors. That's a new community and you don't, you don't try to fix what's broken, you create something better and everybody leaves there and goes to there. And, and for me, I just, uh, I just wanna contribute in some way and make a difference. Well, that's what it means to become supernatural and that's the name of your book and it's, obviously what you're teaching us and if we can all be in this field of becoming supernatural what a beautiful place we would be in that's a start yeah <laughs> thank you so much Joe. you're welcome it's a true pleasure to have you here thank you and if you would like to watch any of my other shows with dr joe dispenza just go to inspirations on gaia i'm lisa gar and until next time i invite you to stay aware